Thank you, James, for that very kind introduction. It is my pleasure to be here today. Uh, and without further ado, uh, I'm going to talk to you about secure payments and whether they are a CX friend or foe. So going from conflict and burden to synergy and opportunity. So what I would like to do first is essentially looking back at uh, uh, two years ago. The world we'd lived in then in 2019 uh, was quite surprising already. This video was produced in 2019 with predictions for 2020. Who knew what we were about to face then? So where are we today? Well, are we ready for digital? In 2016, we had 7.4 billion people and 6.4 billion connected things. The prediction is that in 2025, we'll have 8.1 billion people and 75.4 billion connected things. The pandemic has accelerated hyperconnectivity and digitalization uh, nor, or orders of magnitude uh, from what it would normally have done. Another phenomenon that we have observed is that of mobility. It is predicted that the percentage of workers permanently working from home is expected to double this year. So what, what have we been doing and how have businesses reacted to this? Well, if you look at the, uh, May 2020, uh, Twitter announced that employees will be allowed to work from home forever. Twitter is a digital company, perhaps that is unsurprising. A bit later, Microsoft uh, did exactly the same thing. And more recently, uh, at the beginning of this month, Revolut, as you know, a fintech company, uh, is to move to a permanent remote working model. Now, all those are digital companies that were already very well stacked up to actually make a very, very easy transition. They have the right culture and, uh, uh, and the infrastructure to, to go with that. So what else was happening then? Well, uh, digital culture, is actually extremely important nowadays and the pandemic has made this even more crucial. So if we look at 
the incumbent players, a bank such as Barclays, for example, in summer of last year, they actually very publicly said that they wanted their people back in the office. A few months later, um, they were eyeing further cuts into office space because obviously people weren't returning back to the office. Uh, I was actually expecting uh, from such organization that they would actually uh, start considering new ways of working uh, because after all financial services is just that services, it's not manufacturing uh, and perhaps make uh, provisions for the new working lifestyles that we're all experiencing. But uh, surprisingly, a few days ago, uh, the, the CEO of Barclays still expects staff to return to the office this, this year. Uh, even just looking at that, you can see the difference in, in culture as far as digital is concerned. Uh, similarly, Société Générale in, in France, a very well established uh, financial services institution, uh, actually uh, is giving its employees the right to work from home for up to two days a week. So they're making some moves in that respect. So, uh, so this is where we're living. We're hyper-connected uh, and we are becoming essentially more or less exclusively digital. But we have been forced into this a forced adoption of digital services in 2020, continuing into 2021, a forced adoption of new practices, accelerated innovation at an unprecedented space. Of course, this has also generated new behaviors. It also generates digital inequalities and of course, cultural clashes, some of which I've explained just earlier. So we're all sucked in this vortex, whether we want it or not. So with accelerated digital transformation, the pandemic brought uh, this at a pace uh, of weeks for what would normally have taken four or five years at, at least. Uh, and what this has done is exacerbated trends that we were already observing. Everybody's been talking about the death of the high street uh, for a few years now. You can see this article here, which was produced at the end of uh, uh, 2019 in terms of retail insolvencies. And essentially looking at what's been happening, well, incumbent, you know, household names uh, didn't heed the warning uh, of digital, digitize or, or die. And who knew that an, out, an outfit, an e-commerce digital outfit such as Boohoo would actually be buying Debenhams. Who knew that a digital outfit such as ASOS would be buying parts of the Arcadia Group? We live in very, very strange times. So, and it continues. January retail sales dropped 8.2% as we continue in this third lockdown, which, uh, which is hopefully going to ease off very soon. Now, except, so the drop uh, obviously affected everyone, except non-store retailers and food stores, because obviously we need to eat, but non-store, which is essentially means those digital entities that are, were online or have become online are actually doing pretty well. So this forced innovation uh, has meant a number of things. It's meant that traditionally brick, bricks and mortars outfits have become uh, digital ordering ahead, click and collect and delivery uh, entities. Uh, we've got Starbucks saying that, you know, a quarter of their US orders were placed from a mobile phone. Uh, Uber Eats was trying to help the SME community and waived its delivery fees for independent restaurants to help with the crisis. So there's been a lot of cooperation uh, in that respect as well. Grocery stores converting to new ways of, uh, of working and essentially uh, being more digital. And for consumers, what that has meant, it has meant more convenience, 
and more innovation because you can do things very, very easily now. Uh, and more convenience and innovation leads to more users that you would not normally have had. Uh, the example here is from Morrison's very well-established supermarket in the UK, essentially offering phone order ordering for the vulnerable segment. So essentially phone your order to Morrison to actually get the doorstep delivery. Uh, we've also seen retailers in the fashion industry obviously not doing very well for those that still operate physical shops, um, adopting augmented reality uh, for uh, virtual fitting rooms. So lots of innovation there. And, and if people like them, they will carry on using them if it's of value to them. So what that has meant all in all, it's meant new behaviors. We all have new behaviors, even for those of us that were uh, quite easily operating in a digital fashion. But what the crisis has brought, and this is quite interesting, it's a surge in first time users. First time users, because they have been forced into this digitization and perhaps some services that you can now only access online. So it has been a very, very steep learning curve. But if you look at the statistic there, those users that weren't digital suddenly have, have become digital because of the pandemic. So that's a whole new market seg segment for those that operate online. If we also look at the figures here for uh, 2018 and 2019 from Eurostat in terms of usage uh, of the internet, what do we do on the internet? So bearing in mind that this trend uh, has been magnified by the pandemic, but even if we just look at these statistics, which are a couple of years old, what we actually notice is that quite a lot of the activity that we perform online has act, uh, actually involved some sort of payment. So because it involves some sort of payment immediately, the industry reacts and tries to make it easier for the users of the services. So as early as May of last year, PayPal, for example, rolled out QR code payments for touch-free way to buy and sell in person. Then similarly, uh, and this was last week, Revolut rolled out QR code based payment for business consumers. And that's interesting because there's a new phenomenon. B2B payment has always been less digitized than the B2C payments, uh, but this in 2021 and, uh, and in the years going forward, B2B payments uh, are growing uh, at an exponential fashion if you actually watch the, the payments news. And also uh, last week, and I find this very interesting, Google Maps will let you pay for parking tickets and train tickets inside the app. Imagine how convenient that is to be able to pay for your parking by just looking at Google Maps and say, I want to buy my train ticket and pay for my parking. Easy. No online or web ordering, nothing, just doing, just do it through the map. So, Technology companies understand this really well. Make it easy, make it convenient. And of course, social media. Uh, we mustn't at all, if we're in payment, forget about social media. I mean, if we look at the summer of last year, Instagram launched its free design shop powered by Facebook Pay. So you can now buy directly when you're on Instagram. Um, WhatsApp Pay launched this digital payment in, in uh, a while back. Uh, uh, they were trying to enter a particular market in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil. Brazil is heavily uh, digitized and uh, uh, certainly up there with the best in terms of uh, fintech and digital payments adoption. Uh, but uh, they, uh, WhatsApp had a, had a few troubles with the, with the regulators in, in Brazil, which, uh, which uh, no doubt they will sort out uh, very soon. But they are obviously uh, doing payments uh, in many other geographies. So Shopify, uh, again, uh, this, is, this is very recent, expands shop pay to merchant on Facebook and Instagram. So you see these big payments organization uh, looking at social media uh, with interest. 
TikTok uh, has been in the news quite a lot over 2020, uh, want to enter the e-commerce market. Obviously, it is a very lucrative market. And even Twitter, this was again last week, most digital payment options for users. So they're all basically thinking about payments, whether you're uh, in the technology space, in the social media space. But if we're in payments, we have to realize this. It has become from the like button to the buy button. Social media is now the third shopping channel, and we mustn't forget that. And of course, we've got all the things associated with artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm sure many of you have a smart speaker in your, in your homes or several like me. Uh, and through the use of artificial intelligence, obviously you can do e-commerce as well. I mean, as far back as 2018, Argos was, were already experiencing, experimenting with, the, with this. And in the summer of last year, uh, uh, a big French supermarket, Carrefour, uh, obviously uh, did some experiments in terms of uh, voice shopping using Google Assistant. But more recently, and this was last week again on Valentine's Day, um, uh, and, and, uh, and I'm not advertising anything in particular, other than this is very interesting because uh, uh, Bayer Baroka Boost launched voice commerce radio ad campaign which is essentially using the Alexa shopping cart. So uh, as you can see here, uh, this family is actually right listening now, to the, the radio. The weather is cold and wintry. You can expect yet more morning. Sue calls. Oh, sorry, I always feel tired on days like this. If you feel this way, try Barocca Boost with caffeine to improve alertness and vitamin B12 to help reduce tiredness and fatigue. Switch on your Monday morning. Say launch Barocca Boost on this device now. Alexa, launch Barocca Boost. Welcome to Barocca Boost. Would you like to order some Barocca Boost tablets or hear more information about the product? Order. Would you like to order a package of 20 Barocca Boost using your default payment method and address? Yes. Here are the product details from Amazon. Would you like to buy it? Yes. Thank you for ordering Barocca Boost. Now, what song am I going to play you? Um, can I have Shannon? Let the music play, please. Let the music play. One of our club classics. Good song. Great song. And who's it going to be for? So obviously, as you can see in this video, there, there are a lot of benefits in there, uh, uh, let alone the collection of data uh, that it enables you to do. But if a service like this actually took off and people find it convenient, there is no reason as to why uh, this, this way of, uh, of shopping uh, uh, wouldn't take off uh, if, uh, if consumers actually like it. But the technology is there. It is possible. Of course, we have to look, when you look at the evolution over the last few years, we have to look at open banking. Uh, and you will have noticed that it has been a bit slow in the UK. I mean, three years on now, um, only 3% of the UK population are using open banking services. If we actually contrast that with South Korea, 70% of consumers, or 20 million people, uh, use open banking services within just a year of launch. And that is 23 times the UK adoption rate. Of course, when we look at the Western uh, compared to uh, Eastern markets, there are very marked differences. Uh, the difference here uh, in terms of adoption in South Korea is that they are used to the super app where you do everything and essentially everyone has it, including doing payments and banking and everything else you might want to do on the app, which is why it has been much easier for them because we haven't got the concept of a, of a super app in, in, uh, in Europe, but certainly not in the, in the UK. But nevertheless, it is really interesting. As you can see here, uh, this report uh, uh, on the screen for you, 2021 is deemed to be the landmark year for open banking technology. We saw this happen before. It does take a number of years. I draw you to the parallel of uh, the deployment of faster payments. Now, faster payments is part of our lives. We want to do a payment through our online banking facility. 
We just do that, we don't even think about it. And that's part of life. But if we cast our mind back to 2008, when faster payments was actually launched, uh, within a year of uh, launch, only 83,000 payments were actually made. It took four years of faster payments to actually reach, reach mass adoption. Now we're only three years into open banking. Uh, so granted the pandemic has accelerated digitization. So it is a fair call to say that 2021 will most probably be the year of open banking as uh, everyone is forced in, into digital <clears throat> uh, and, and more awareness uh, is actually uh, driven uh, by either will or, or necessity. So take up, is expected to grow uh, for two reasons. First of all, uh, the range, the quality, the reliability of APIs available for open banking services continues to increase at the pace. And the second reason is people realize the benefits of value added application and services to them by using those services. So more communication is uh, uh, is needed or around that, but I have no doubt this uh, this will happen. And the source here is Octopus Ventures, so uh, I think they know a thing or two uh, when they predict uh, market adoption. So that was open banking and a bit of a roundup on technology. So uh, this has, of course, brought new behaviors, and new behaviors bring new challenges. So. We all acknowledge that we now have to be digital first. There is a school of thought that says you have to be mobile first, but you know, broadly speaking, you have to be digital first. And if you look at the, this data here produced uh, at the beginning of uh, this year, uh, you can see in front of you the most used digital first features that consumers actually like. So contactless card or digital wallets, obviously very, very popular, but lots of other options are becoming increasingly popular as well. And we have to understand uh, the behaviors of our customers to understand which facilities uh, to give them. But unfortunately, there are misunderstood consumer expectations. When offering payments facility and goods and services to consumers, merchant thinks that the most important features are the ability to create digital profiles and to have life, life help and to price match, where in fact, consumers prefer rewards, free, ship, free shipping and data protection. Consumers also want to feel safe. They don't care about creating a digital profile. In fact, you know, probably providing a guest checkout is one very, very valuable feature. So misunderstood consumer expectation on behalf of the merchants is probably what, what is also driving slower adoption. And of course, retaining and enhancing trust. Because essentially what consumers want is they want uh, uh, the, the businesses they do business with to know them, to value them, to have what they want, to make it convenient for them, but also to protect them. So retaining and enhancing trust is absolutely important. So having said all of that, when new services come on the market, consumers might try them, but it has to be better than what or they already have, otherwise they will quickly abandon it. So yes, putting something new out is, is great, but looking at what customers are after and what they value is absolutely crucial uh, to compete on that very small piece of real estate that is this mobile phone. So new behaviors also bring new risks. So there are new ecosystem risks, as you can see, here, uh, authorized push payment fraud continues to, to plague us. Um, synthetic fraud reaching new highs uh, and identity theft in general uh, is still 
the scourge of the payments industry. Of course, there are so many data breaches around with so many valid credentials being dumped uh, on the dark web for criminals to use uh, as they see fit, see fit and conduct attacks, uh, often dubbed as credential stuffing attacks to actually attack companies which haven't been breached, but purely because people actually reuse passwords and credentials across services that they have access to, uh, and, and, and we get into uh, uh, this sort of mess. Um, predicted that last year's challenges in financial crime, I'm sure you will have seen many, many fines being levied, not only uh, from a um, data protection or data security aspect, but also from an anti-money laundering uh, aspect, uh, will continue to gather pace this year. And of course, we've got uh, uh, the pandemic has brought uh, uh, adoption or an increase of adoption in services that make it easy for consumers to spread the costs, such as buy now, pay later. Uh, and early, early on this year, there was a, a warning to say, you know, after all, buy now, pay later is a credit facility. So are we uh, putting ourselves up for, for a fall later on? So new business models themselves create new, new risk and certainly buy now, pay later is becoming extremely popular. So new ecosystem risk. What we also have is regulatory pressures. Now, all of you listening uh, will be familiar to some extent with the second payment services directive or, or PSD2. We do know that the UK delayed it a bit further until later on this year. Uh, how to maximize the remaining time until the September deadline uh, is, is crucial for organization. This is a compliance matter. So there's regulatory pressure here. Uh, and of course, I mentioned buy now, pay later earlier on, as soon uh, as a service or a facility becomes of uh, somewhat systemic importance, the, the regulators actually pay attention. Uh, and as you can see here at the beginning of February, um, plans to actually regulate buy now, pay later products. Um, uh, similar in the way that uh, uh, payday land, lending round about, you know, 2015, I, I think it was, uh, or off, had to be regulated more stringently because people were essentially getting, uh, getting into trouble. So regulatory pressures. Um, and of course, data protection, UK ranked second for the value of GDPR fines issued in 2020. This is said to continue. Uh, and I don't know uh, if you followed this one, but certainly this is the online harms bill. And, uh, uh, and Anne Bowden, CEO of Starling Bank, criticized the, the government for, for not including uh, financial crime or financial fraud into the new online harms bill. Uh, I have to say, I tend to, I, I actually completely agree with, uh, with Anne. I mean, technology companies are regulated for, you know, uh, making sure that nobody comes to harm uh, uh, when using the internet. But uh, if, uh, you know, a digital company essentially host services that are phishing websites or that are hosting scams, they should be held accountable too. Unfortunately, this is not part of the current online harm bills in the UK. So something to, to watch out for. And there are of course industry pressures. So I mentioned PSD2 earlier on. So, so let's look at that. So the, the deadline for strong customer authentication uh, was 31st of December of last year for, for the European Economic Area. The deadline for us here in the UK is September 2021. So still a bit of time, but you know, there are also industry pressures and financial pressures in as much as MasterCard actually doubled the authentication fees in January on those that still remain on 3D Secure version one. And Visa will remove the liability shift on 3DS uh, version one authenticated transaction 
from October onwards, uh, and, it, and, and it's very, very uh, probable that uh, all the other schemes will, will follow suit either before or, or after that. But uh, for merchants, this is definitely something to, to watch out for. So these are new risks, you know, associated with the new behaviors. Uh, and if we look at the latest report from the World Economic Forum, um, they call cybersecurity the key threat of the next decade. Uh, and uh, the statistics are, are, are quite uh, stark. Uh, in terms of short-term risk, zero to two years, they call this clear and pres present dangers. You can see cybersecurity failure and digital inequality uh, are ranked fourth and, and fifth respectively. So that's, that's quite worrying. Uh, and if we look at knock-on effects, so medium-term risk, three to five year, uh, cybersecurity failures and tech governance failures as well as in IT infrastructure breakdown, as a result of all of this, uh, are pretty much in the, in the top 10 risks. So it's a worrying uh, world we, we live in. So we have regulations, uh, but, uh, and, and they're all good. Uh, and, and they have good intent. But let's not forget, the law is for the lawful. The law aims to protect ecosystems and so on and so forth. And what we're facing here is long regulatory cycles. You know, as an example, PSD2 was passed in 2015. So it takes a long time for regulation to come into effect and to address uh, risk to any particular ecosystem. So why we back? We do know that authentication needs to be needs to be improved. Uh, if we look at the way digitization is moving, as you can see on those uh, statistics which I already presented to you earlier on, uh, it is going much faster than regulations can actually cope with. So regulatory cycles don't affect fraudsters. They can carry on using technology. They can carry on uh, finding weaknesses in systems, services, processes, and certainly exploiting them uh, to great effect. To boot, global events such as a pandemic are very conducive to criminal purposes. And I'm sure you've all seen the kind of scams uh, that we've been facing over the past year or so. And also, and uh, worryingly, criminals innovate too, they cooperate too, and they use technology too. So just like we use AI and we use automation to optimize fraud prevention activities, just like we cooperate on threat intelligence and use technology, they do exactly the same thing. They study new services until they find loophole and they exploit them. So it is a constant battle. Um, and of course, consumers will not stop adopting new technologies. They will carry on sharing more and more data and more and more they will demand safety and expect their trust not to be broken. And businesses need to understand that. So uh, it's no good sort of wait, waiting for for the regulation and having a compliance mindset, as in the deadline is, you know, in a number of months, years time, and therefore I can wait until then and I still have time. The trick really is not to procrastinate. It's about doing the right thing to protect your organization and to protect consumers at large as well. And largely technologies and processes are actually there to help. But criminals will always be a few steps ahead because that's the very nature of the beast. So regulations, they try to do the right thing. They try to promote innovation, as you can see here. What they also try to do is to promote competition. And what they also try to do is to protect ecosystems and individuals, and we have lots of those. So trying to do right, and it's not just about regulations. It's about standards as well. 
So when I say regulation law and statutes such as the Second Payment Services Directive or Anti-Money Laundering Directives or anything that is passed into law in a given geography, but we also have standards that are very relevant to our payments ecosystem, for example, PCI DSS, for example, 3D Secure. So all of these things try to do the right thing to maintain the integrity of any given ecosystem. So if I give you the example of PCI DSS, for example, I'm sure some of you who have been in the industry as long as I have been will remember this, the self-assessment questionnaire version one was produced in 2004. That was a one size fits all approach. I think the document was about 11 pages long. Uh, everybody was quite scared of it. It was a bit obscure and everything else, but it was a revolution, a very good set of security controls, albeit uh, it was quite difficult to, to understand and everybody was grappling with it. So, but that was it, that was just it. That's what you had to do, these, these 12 requirements and you do that. Well industry standards move with the times as well and look at it now from one size fits all we now have 15 standards so the one we had originally is this one at the top here the PCI DSS and now you can see how it has evolved since there but uh, and particularly if you look at here software-based pin entry on cuts and uh, contactless payment on cuts, on, on cuts and various other software facility. Uh, uh, what that essentially is saying is the ability to use consumer of the shelf devices to, to accept payments, because that's the way the world is moving. Everybody is doing, uh, uh, is, is doing things on their own devices, their own mobile phones or, or tablets and standards that want to future proof themselves have to move with the times as well. Now, the next thing is as well, you will notice here, PCI 3D Secure 3DS Core, you know, in line uh, with 3D Secure. So the standards are aligning to essentially make the ecosystem faster. So regulations evolve as well, but it does take time for it to happen, but they certainly try to understand the environment we, we live in. So it's kind of a, a, a very good story for the PCI DSS in terms of how they've moved on uh, over the years. Another example is uh, 3D Secure and strong customer authentication. Now, uh, verified by Visa, 2001, can you believe 20 years we've had that? And this really, is a customer experience evolution, uh, if there was one. So verified by Visa to all intents and purposes, 3DS1. So what was it by, by then? Well, it met compliance, you know, if we're looking at strong customer authentication, but it offers very little flexibility. So uh, for example, it's lack of availability on mobile and, and IoT devices. Uh, it supports OTP, but not biometrics. And also, uh, and this is a very big point, it doesn't support PSD2 exemptions. So, so that was then, that was 3DS1. So then obviously EMV code took over the management of uh, the 3D Secure standard. And in 2016, we've got the 3DS2.1 specification. And this one is all about customer experience. Uh, so what does it do? Well, greatly improved CX for strong customer authentication, especially on mobile. It supports biometrics, 10 times more data, and merchants can actually ask for no step up. But I mean, it is a limited capability, but they can do that. So if we look at the difference between 3DS 2.1 and 3DS 1, uh, you can see it's kind of a no brainer. Uh, Furthermore, if we look at 3DS 2.2, that's essentially customer experience. Plus, it supports SCA exemptions. I'll talk about that in a minute. It allows for merchant initiation initiated transactions, even if the card holder is offline. For, for those who have been in, in, in payments for, for a while, you will understand what that means. Uh, for the others, this is essentially, you can allow for subscription payments. 
you know, recurring payments. It also allows for whitelisting, which is something that is allowed under the PSD2. For example, me saying, I absolutely trust this retailer I'm about to, to pay. So please don't uh, authenticate me and let me go through it because this is a trusted entity as far as I'm concerned. It also supports decoupled authentication. So this is a very big one because this is an example of where an industry standard is actually ahead of the regulation. So for those who are familiar with the Second Payment Services Directive, you will know that mail order, telephone order, or motor transaction are not in scope of the regulation. Well, 3DS 2.2 allows for decoupled authentication, which is essentially you can perform the transaction and you can perform the authentication later on, which is very, very applicable to motor. So uh, I urge merchant to really, really understand the benefits of both 2.1 and 2.2 as to what they can do and, and, and the benefits it actually gives them. And it also supports delegated authentication. Uh, and, and delegated authentication essentially allows a merchant to do one-click payments just like Amazon. And that's great. So you can see that this is really a CX evolution story as far as a payment security standard is concerned. You know, pictorially, if you, if you, if you want to look at the, the way it was, it was a very simple flow with 3DS1 from the merchant essentially to the issuer. Now you get all that. You get all this information that it passed in the message that enables you to do so many more things and, and to make it so much more experiential for the end customer. So 3D Secure, CX, friend or foe? Well, I've hopefully I've demonstrated that it's definitely improved CX and promoting a frictionless flow. There is more data in the transaction, so therefore, less active authentication, reduced step-ups, soft declines, therefore less abandonment, reduced chargeback, allows for exemptions such as whitelist and so on and so forth, uh, and transaction under a certain limit. So there are many of those. So in front of you is a very recent study by, uh, by Visa. And essentially what they say is that transaction time uh, uh, is reduced by 85%. And cart abandonment is reduced by 70%. That's massive figures. I mean, those two figures in terms of transaction time reduction and cart abandonment, that's essentially impact on the bottom line. So merchants should pay really great attention to the deployment of, uh, of uh, 3DS uh, 2.1, 2.2, you know, earlier rather than later because it has real benefits. So 3D Secure CX friend or foe, well, basically, if it is deployed effectively, because you need to understand all these things and how to, how to set it up and what to take advantage of. And what that means is you have to understand your customers and what they're likely to do and where the feature of any particular um, type of uh, payment security facilities are in order to be able to deploy them where they have the most impact. So in my book, 3D Secure, definitely a CX friend uh, if it is deployed effectively. So, and it depends completely on the implementation. So. Let's take the example of Brazil. I know I mentioned Brazil earlier on, but, but Brazil is, is a very digital market, certainly when it comes to, to payments, they use cards a lot. Uh, and this is from a, a, a recent Ravlin report on uh, uh, payment regulation and authentication. And if, you, and if you look at that particular market, so top three payment methods in Brazil Credit and debit card, 60%. So basically a statistically relevant market. Uh, post pair 16% and e-wallet at 11%. So if we agree that 
it is a very large, a very large proportion of payments are made by credit or debit card. Uh, look at the, the figures that are associated with 3D Secure. Well, essentially, the number, oops, the number of payments that were lost um, uh, through 3D Secure in 2019 was 58 percent, and in 20, and in 20 uh, 20, it more than halved. So less payment loss, more than halved in 2020. In terms of acceptance rate of 3D Secures, uh, it nearly doubled. In terms of the proportion of payments that are deemed frictionless, which means it takes less than five seconds to authenticate, it more than doubled. And in terms of the average time, to authenticate, uh, it nearly halved. So this is a very big uh, success story in terms of payment security. So let's look at another market. Let's look at the United Kingdom. You know, what do you think it looks like? And you'll be surprised, or maybe you won't be surprised, but these are the figures. So again, large proportion of payments performed by credit and debit card and quite a lot performed by e-wallets. But if we look at the number of payments that were lost to 3D Secure, um, it drastically reduced. So that's a good story. National average in the UK for last year. Uh, and in terms of the 3D Secure payment acceptance rate, it increased substantially to 91%. But look at the other figures. The number of frictionless payments as those that takes less than five seconds to authenticate is one percent uh, and the average time to authenticate actually increased in instead of decreasing so uh, so that's that's quite worrying really that we have the technology to enable us to uh, offer frictionless secure payments one market brazil can do it very well one market, the United Kingdom, not doing so well in terms of CX. So again, it depends on the implementation. So, and there are many misunderstandings. Uh, I briefly mentioned that earlier on, but UK merchants misunderstand what customers think is important. And one very big thing in there, in the yellow, data security is an afterthought for consumers. No, it is not. Consumers absolutely care about their information, their data, and their sensitive data, and especially their payment data. Customers want to feel valued. They expect convenience. They want their data to be protected. Again, merchants actually misunderstand that. If we look at strong customer authentication, again, this is faster payment all over again. Lack of awareness, you know, only a third of UK consumers have heard about authentication from their bank because their banks have been the banks have been quite diligent, in fact, in the communicated on online communicating on online banking and what you know authentication means and such like. But very few have heard from a retailer. Very few, uh, even less, have heard from other sources. But essentially, uh, more than half of the population is, is unaware of the changes and what that means for them, uh, which is sad really and which is a complete missed opportunity because consumers as you can see in the top graphic care about data protection so only 34 percent of uk merchants plan to seek exemptions and i would argue perhaps quite a lot of merchants don't understand what the exemptions means but the exemption also mean that you have to understand yourself. You have to understand the data you have. You have to understand what you do with it. You have to understand your fraud rates. You have to understand your customers. And then you will be able to apply many exemptions that will make the payment interaction near frictionless if you actually understand what to do with it. So again, it depends on the implementation. Surprisingly, only 30% of UK merchants plan to use the opportunity to optimize their fraud management strategies 
on the back of regulation and standards. And I hope I've shown you that the standards and the regulation are actually trying to do the right thing, but uh, merchants are absolutely lagging behind in something that could be quite lucrative for them. So if we establish that convenience and trust is the baseline, success means an experience-driven customer journey. It also means a seamless, omni-device, omni-channel interaction tool. It also means strong security standards and a holistic approach to regulations. Um, what I find generally is that entities, especially uh, larger ones, the larger SME and large organization, um, will treat regulations separately. And it's all very well to have a, a PCI DSS team and a PSD2 team and a GDPR team, but at the end of the day, many of the requirements for uh, standards and regulation essentially overlap. So if we don't look at regulation in a holistic fashion, we might end up spending money several times to address the same problem. So avoiding regulatory silos is absolutely crucial because I hope I have demonstrated, you know, how they are all converging to address the same problems and have been doing so for quite a while. And it also means a layered approach to security and fraud prevention uh, using technology, using automation uh, and new technology to enhance or remodel processes or make existing processes more efficient so that your staff can concentrate on value added activities. But the technologies are there to help you. It's looking at the, the, the processes that you have and certainly the people uh, that you have that will become crucial because technology on its own will not solve any problem. So in our new normal, consumers, including first time users, will continue to use what they find convenient, but they will rapidly discard what they don't need, like or trust. So essentially, payment security, CX, friend or foe, um, I'll let you decide. And thank you for listening. <laughs>